So the, the, the link is that your body, when it senses that there are nutrients, it wants to grow. So when you have a condition of hyperinsulinemia, that is too much insulin all the time, well, then your body's getting the signal, grow, 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 which is going to favor cancer cells that are, you know, take that signal and then sort of run with it. So therefore, if you want to really look at it, you look at this and say, okay, well, if the disease is too much insulin, which is the same problem that you have in obesity, same problem you have in type 2 diabetes, well, then lower insulin, right? It's just like if you have too much thyroid hormone, lower the thyroid hormone. If you have too little thyroid hormone, take some. So if you have too much insulin, you got to lower it. And the question is, how are you going to do that? And that's where you'd say, well, different foods have different insulin stimulating effects. So ketogenic diets, for example, don't stimulate insulin that much. So therefore, if your disease has too much insulin, then you can use something like a ketogenic diet to lower your insulin levels, or even better, intermittent fasting, you can actually lower your insulin levels sort of maximally, and therefore, um, you know, try and hopefully reduce that growth signaling to prevent your cancer. So the way it works, of course, is that as you use this low carbohydrate approach, what you do is you wind up losing weight, you wind up reversing your type 2 diabetes. And of course, that is going to lower your risk of cancer because cancer is not something that develops overnight. It's, it's something that develops over 10 or 15 years. So it's always this sort of balance. So, you know, that's, that's the important thing, I think, is to really focus on those, uh, those parts. It's really a metabolic disease, just like, it, it, it's crazy how it all comes together, <laughs> like obesity, type 2 diabetes. They're basically diseases of hyperinsulinemia. So is something like breast cancer. That's not purely a disease of hyperinsulinemia, but it contributes, just like smoking contributes to lung cancer. You can smoke for 50 years and never get cancer. You could do the same with hyperinsulinemia. But what you see in China, of course, is this explosion of breast cancer. And what do you see right alongside of it? Obesity, type 2 diabetes. Like, it's crazy how much type 2 diabetes. liver, all of it. It's yeah. crazy in China. Their, 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 their rates are skyrocketing. It's so bad. Rates and absolute volumes. You know, I would um, sometimes uh, the word keto draws a lot of fire. And uh, you, you, a conversation can be uh, lost because you spend so much time uh, dealing with the uh, paradoxically inflammatory effects of the word keto. <laughs> and um, what uh, uh, our nutrition, our dietitian Kartika, who sits with me every day, um, we, we consistently tell patients what we're known for keto and low carb, but what we really offer is culturally appropriate nutritional interventions for chronic disease and, and try not to get tied to any one way. But what we're trying to achieve with everyone is a low insulin lifestyle. That, that's really the key. And whether it's through a nutritional you know, manipulation of low carb, keto, fasting, intermittent fasting, whether it's by focusing on sleep, whether it's by adding metformin, whether it's strength training, Whatever the patient can do to begin to lower their insulin levels is the best first step for both prevention of disease as, as well as to improve treatment of, of pre disease that may be present. And, and you just got to find that book. But it's, it, it's all about insulin up front. Uh, I think your book clearly shows, I mean, there's a lot more to, to talk about. I would throw in one other thing because you, you, covered breast and colon cancer. Uh, I used to treat and still do a, a, a lion's share of prostate cancer. And, and one of the interesting things about prostate cancer is that a diagnosis of prostate cancer in many ways is a risk factor for heart disease. And the presence of heart disease is a risk factor for prostate cancer because they're both being driven through the same hyperinsulinemic pathway uh, and, and this has been shown very clearly in a couple of studies of prostate cancer prevention with the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors that, that you're much more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer in a prevention study in otherwise healthy adults in North America if you have heart disease. Uh, it, it's a significant increase. And we work closely with a few cardiologists because we're, we're obviously obsessive about nutrition and uh, cancer prevention. 
And I can tell so many of my prostate cancer patients, I will, I will absolutely look them in the eye and tell them that there is no way you as a 70 year old man are ever going to die of prostate cancer. If we, you know, continue your diet, nutrition, and just watchful waiting. Wow. But if you don't address the heart disease, you're going to have big problems. And so you just, you have to get a hyper motivated cardiology team who's going to be on board because you, you, everybody will do people. When you ask someone to do keto or low carb, the man in the street, they're like, maybe, maybe not. That sounds interesting or that sounds crazy. But when somebody has been told they have cancer, the single most, to me, it's still the single most potent word in any language, suddenly they're willing to do things that they wouldn't have done before to look at their health through a completely different lens. And it's an unfortunate set of timing, but it being the optimist, it creates that opportunity to reevaluate what health really means and how you want to live the rest of your life. And I'm talking about people who are being cured, stage one, two, three, breast cancer, prostate, <clears throat> early colon, and, and, and even lung. They, they re-look at how they're going to make their choices uh, for the next 20 years. Uh, I'm sure you see that as well in, in some of the, even the kidney patients. Canadians and stuff. It's Just to add to the, the personalized thing, like one of the things that after the conversation I had with Stephen um, on our uh, show was continuous glucose monitoring. So I, I, I tried a, a Libre for two weeks. And so just to, just to address some of the comments in here, people, just to be clear, hyperinsulinemia, access to sugar, of carbohydrate of any sort, your pancreas releases insulin, and to try and uh, reduce that, uh, the amount of uh, sugar in your bloodstream, and so the higher, hyper being higher levels of insulin, uh, and we're saying we're, you got to try and mitigate that as much as you can. Keto is one way for some people. Low carb is some way for some people, but it's personalized. What, what, what works for you might not work for somebody else. And what, one of the things that allowed for identification of what might be cause higher sugars in one person than another is uh, this uh, tool using a continuous glucose monitor. So you would, what, what I, oh, there it is. Oh, I love it. I was so addicted to this thing. So for two weeks, <laughs> literally you get a, a 15 minute, every 15 minutes you get your glucose measured. Okay. And I got to tell you as a, a like I'm, I'm, I'm healthy fit or whatever, but the, the information was fascinating. Okay. Like if I'm on call, and I, I, I got three hours of sleep, higher sugars. If I um, had white rice, ironically, higher sugars. If I, was, if I was weight training, my glucose was like this, son, like for, for hours after. Like the information you gained from that was unbelievable. And it was inspiring too, because it's like, hey, this is, what my, this, like, this is what my body is responding to. And, and it, it quite correlated with how you felt too. And so, like, what a tool, man. Like, just in terms of, once again, personalizing your approach to medicine. Um, I think it gets back to the, to the word sensor. That there's, and, and also, I mean, you know, you're fit. You're, you, you know, you say you work out. You eat a decent diet. The sensors also tell you never judge the book by its cover. Uh, you, you look at the Chinese, and they still look lean. They look mm -hmm. thin but the amount of fatty liver, the amount of visceral fat is very different than when you assess a non-Asian population. So at the end of the day, uh, whether when you're personalizing, it's data, it's, it's, it's without judgment, it's, you know, these are your numbers, and what did you do that made these numbers go up or down? And you're right, how did you feel at the same time? I think that's all really, really important. But, but having one of these, and we put these on our oncology patients all the time. And um, it's, they're useful. They're far more useful for people who have never had diabetes or pre-diabetes. Um, uh, I would say by, by numbers, because the, it's, such a, it's such a big denominator there, because you can do such prevention by giving these insights. Um, the perceived efforts, the understanding of what really makes your glucose go up, 
and what you can avoid and what you can do and enjoy while keeping your glucose down. And I'll tell you what really um, frustrates a lot of people is how much alcohol disrupts their sleep and drives their glucose initially down and then up overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, it, it, Im it emphasizes just how important sleep is. And uh, Jason can tell you that people with chronic sleep disruption uh, also increase their risk, at least statistically, for certain lifestyle related cancers. Yeah, and I think it gets back to the whole, you know, the title of this podcast, which is Solving Healthcare, right? And this is what's important to preventing all these diseases is this stuff, the glucose monitor, the nutrition, the stuff you do day, the sleep, the stress, the stuff you do day in and day out. And yet what we're focused on as a medical system is the drug, is the surgery, bariatrics like it's it's just like sometimes i look back and say boy like <laughs> no wonder people think the doctors are just in it for the box right because you, you you know that this approach is completely backwards because there's so much data on cardiovascular disease metabolic disease and cancer like for for you know it's uh, it's all heart disease and cancer which ca uh, which kills people and uh, all we're focused on is like, uh, oh, the latest uh, anticoagulant, right? <laughs> it's like, like how many new NOACs do we have, right? It's like, oh, we have like five or six new, oh, and they're, they're debating the benefit of, you know, this new Relative risk reduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? And it's so frustrating because then you're saying, well, why are you not taking like a 1% of that energy that we're doing as doctors and saying, look, we got to get out there. We got to talk about sugar. We got to talk about not eating all the time because honestly, we give the opposite advice, eat all the time, right? That's there all the time. We got to get out there and say, look, if you're obese, you need to, you need to really work on this and here's different ways. Like,